and got it. We are recording. And um, I am speaking to you today, though, from uh, Mi'kmaq, the, the land of the Mi'kmaq um, in Nova Scotia. And I will be I will be moving to um, Montreal at the end of the month. So uh, having said that, I also wanted to note that the um, photographs in this talk, of which there will be a lot, um, are all taken by my partner and collaborator, Sean McCann, um, unless otherwise indicated. So um, this, this talk is about spiders and their secret lives, but in order to, to talk about them, I want to um, begin by talking about what spiders are and what they are not. So this is a picture of a spider. Um, what makes a spider a spider? Spiders are not insects, as I'm sure you know. Um, insects have three body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and three pairs of legs, making a total of six. Whereas spiders um, are relatives, they're also arthropods, they're quite similar to insects, but um, they have only two body segments. So a combined head and thorax called the cephalothorax and an abdomen in the rear end um, and four pairs of legs for a total of eight. Um, they also have these um, bits at the front called um, petty palps, which are like a smaller pair of legs. You could think of them almost like arms um, that they use to manipulate food and to taste um, and things like that. And then they have uh, fang tipped chelicerae, which is um, the mouth parts or the, the sort of business end of the spider. Um, here's another spider um, just with different looking versions of the chelicerae and the petty palps. And then um, how we tell the difference between male and female spiders is actually by looking at these little appendages called the petty palps. So um, in this slide, we've got a common house spider. Um, and on the top is a female and she's got slender little petty palps that look sort of just like um, miniature legs. And on the bottom, we have a male um, and he, he has longer legs and sort of a skinnier body, um, but overall is pretty similar to looking. But the main difference is that his petty palps um, are tipped with uh, modified um, ends for transferring sperm. These are the, um, the the sperm transfer organs, um, the, the copulatory organs of the spiders. So um, in this species, they're kind of long and have a little bit of a bulb. In some species, they're very round and sort of boxing glove-like shaped. Um, I think I've got another example of that. So yes, um, spiders like the black widow are much more sexually dimorphic with males and females, different color, different sizes. But again, the female has these small, um, like like petty palps at the front, the male has round, modified boxing glove like petty palps. Um, and these interact in spiders with a genital opening on the abdomen of the female called an epigenum. And spiders have very odd um, copulatory behavior, sperm transfer behavior compared to other animals um, because their petty palps, their copulatory organs are not actually connected to their gonads. So males produce sperm in the abdomen, and then they make this special little sperm web, which you can see at the center of this image. Um, it's kind of a little triangular bit of silk above the male, and there's a white glob of fluid, which is seminal fluid, and the male is in the act of sucking up that seminal fluid into his modified petty palps, which he uses sort of like turkey basters um, to transfer sper sperm into the female's genitalia. So that's sort of spider sex ed 101. Oh, sorry. And here is just a close up look of those modified appendages. They're quite elaborate in many species. This is the male black widow's petty palps. And so they actually have these corkscrew shaped um, ends called emboli, the singular is embolus. And this bit that I've um, marked at the end, the apical sclerite, can actually break off inside of the female's genitalia and act as a mating plug, which prevents subsequent males from, um, from fertilizing her. 
Um, this is what it looks like when the male's petty palps are interacting with the female's genitalia. And that's, that's it for the, the backgrounder on spider sex and, um, and telling whether they're males or females. So one of the main features that makes a spider a spider is that they have silk glands in their abdomen. Of course, other animals, many insects can make silk, but they tend to make silk um, in their head and, and secrete it through mouth parts. Spiders have a variety of silk glands in their abdomen, um, and all these different glands make different kinds of silk, which are used for different things, like making their egg sac sacs, like uh, capturing prey, um, like drag lines, um, building webs, and sticky silk um, on the webs, different kinds of silk for wrapping the prey, and so on. And those uh, abdominal spinnerets are connected to, uh, sorry, the ab abdominal silk glands are connected to spinnerets at the end of the abdomen. Um, they can be barrel shaped like in this, um, this ground spider. They can be long and skinny and um, the spider can wave them around in other species like this grass spider or house spider. Um, and the exception to the rule that spiders have abdominal silk glands. Um, this spider, the spitting spider, it does make silk in the abdomen like, like other spiders, but also uniquely it has silk glands in its head as well. Um, and it actually spits a combination of silk and glue at its prey. Um, and I'll note here, so I've got an asterisk beside, behind, beside the name of the spider on this slide. Um, I'm, I'm indicating all of the spiders that we can find in Ontario um, with an asterisk. Some spiders in the presentation we won't have in Canada or in Ontario, um, but this is one that you could potentially find uh, in your house in Southern Ontario. Really neat, um, unusual spiders with only six eyes, you'll notice that it's got sort of three little pairs of eyes. Most spiders have eight eyes, some have only six, some four, some two, some zero. So spiders have been around a really long time, sort of proto spiders, um, just not quite spiders, were um, around more than 400 million years ago in the Silurian and Devonian. And then the first spiders arose um, just over 300 million years ago. So these are very ancient animals. Um, they've been around a long time. And this group, um, this picture is of a mesophile from Asia. They um, look, pretty similar to like a tarantula, um, but you'll notice on the abdomen, it's got segments. Um, and so this modern spider is probably what the, um, the earliest spider about 300 million years ago looked like. Uh, today, we have more than 49,000 species of spiders worldwide, um, almost 1,500 species in Canada. At last count, that was in 2019. So um, it's probably gone up since then because people are constantly uh, finding and, uh, and identifying new species. Um, and spiders are found in almost every terrestrial habitat. They're found on deserts, on beaches, at the tops of mountains. Um, there's a spider that lives near the top of Mount Everest. Uh, they live in um, ponds. Some spiders spend almost all of their life underwater. Um, they live in the Arctic. So they've really sort of uh, conquered all terrestrial habitats. They're on all continents except for Antarctica. Um, and even in some aquatic ones. Some of them um, live on beaches and, and are periodically submerged by salt water. Um, they're very diverse in their lifestyles and, and habitats. And uh, we'll get into that with some of their superpowers and behaviors later on. So this is, um, spiders are divided into a number of families. Um, this is just some of them. This is a tree showing their relationships, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but the three names that I'm pointing out, um, I'm going to uh, talk about mesotheli, megalomorphy, and araniomorphy are kind of the three main groups that I want you to know about. And so here's a simplified version of that tree where all spiders are in the group araniae on the left. Um, the most uh, basal lineage, the one that I showed you at the beginning, thus these spiders that still look more or less like the first spiders looked with segmented abdomens are called the mesothelae. We don't have those in North America. 
And then um, this other branch that leads to the mygalomorphs and the araniomorphs um, are two branches that we do have in North America. The mygalomorphs include the tarantulas um, and a number of relatives, and they have silk but no glue. So their silk is not sticky. It's just um, sort of dry and it's used to transmit vibrations, but it's not, um, it's not gluey, so it doesn't capture prey that way. And then the other lineage is the Araniomorphy, the true spiders or, or modern spiders. This is sort of everyone else. These are your typical spiders um, that you find in your homes and, and all over North America. So we do actually have a few mygalomorphs in Canada. We don't have tarantulas, but we have relatives. Uh, on the West Coast, we have um, Antrodiaetus pacificus. Um, they, they look sort of tarantula-like, and you can also actually see on the abdomen, it has these sort of patches that are reminiscent of the, the segmented abdomens of, um, of the earliest spiders. And then in Ontario, we have um, a spider called Sphodros niger, a purse web spider. They're extremely rarely seen. Um, the, the females live in these purse webs um, and almost never come out. This is a male, and so they can sometimes be seen wandering around um, when they are looking for females to mate with. Um, and although the spider looks pretty fearsome with its massive jaws, um, they're really quite small. Like I, I saw a photo earlier when I was looking online of one next to a penny. And so it's, it's not much longer uh, in body length than a penny. So quite tiny tarantula relatives. So arachnids, um, a lot of people, if they, they hear the word arachnid or think arachnophobia, they think spiders, but arachnids are actually a larger group that has several orders. So the order Araniae is the spiders, um, and it is just one of traditionally 11, but um, according to recent evidence, maybe 12 orders of arachnids. Um, and so again, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but this is a uh, recent publication with a tree showing um, arachnids and their relatives. And you'll notice this horseshoe crab right in the middle. Um, horseshoe crab, crabs weren't traditionally thought of as arachnids, um, but genetic evidence um, suggests that they are, are actually um, sort of in the middle of, of the family tree of arachnids. And we may need to rethink our classification scheme. Um, so horseshoe crabs may be the, um, the newest member of, of arachnids. Um, we've also got these wonderful, strange creatures called hooded tick spiders, um, wind scorpions or, or camel spiders. We do have, have these in North America. Um, I think we actually do have them in Canada. Yeah, in BC, in the desert. This is a desert species. Um, this particular one is from uh, the Southwestern United States, but I think we do have one species in Canada. Um, this is definitely from, from Canada. This is a scorpion, the northern scorpion from uh, central British Columbia. Um, and just cool cool note about uh, scorpions. They give live birth to their young and then carry the babies around on their back. Um, you might recognize this animal from the Harry Potter movies if you saw those. Uh, this is a whip spider or tailless whip scorpion in the order Amblypygii. We don't have these in Canada, but they are in the in the States. Um, you're probably familiar with these red velvet mites. Very small, can find them pretty much everywhere. Uh, ticks are one that you probably um, don't enjoy as much, but we're we're having to uh, to deal with them more and more in in, um, in Canada. Vinegaroons, this is another cool group of arachnids um, that they don't have venom, but they have this long tail that you see at the back end. And they actually use that to spray acetic, ac acetic acid um, in defense. So that's why they're called the vinegaroons because they essentially spray vinegar out of their tail. Uh, pseudoscorpions, this is a book pseudoscorpion. It lives between the pages of books and feeds on book lice. So you might have these in your home. And finally, uh, harvesters, order opilionis, um, not spiders. They do have eight legs like all of the other arachnids that I've shown, um, but they are in a different group. You see, I, I, I mentioned that spiders have two body segments. If you look at this animal, it kind of just has one. The, the head area and the abdomen are sort of fused together into one main body segment. And these animals don't have venom, unlike spiders. Okay, so 
now let's get on to, to spiders and their secret lives and super powers. And I, I've organized this into three themes uh, around eat, pray, love. So spiders eat mainly insects. Um, and I will talk a little bit about how they don't bite humans because this is a common misconception. So spiders have venom um, that they produce in venom glands in their head. Um, again, this is, this is one of these things where it's, most spiders have this, the vast majority of spiders have this, but there is, um, there are exceptions. Two families have no venom. They've lost it um, because they don't need it. Um, but what venom is for is um, certainly not for biting people. It is for immobilizing and killing prey. It also begins the digestion process. Spiders do a digestion outside of their body. So they bite their prey, then they um, sort of vomit out digestive enzymes into the prey's body. Um, and it breaks down the prey tissue and then the spider slurps it back up like a uh, milkshake. And this is one of the two families of spiders that don't have venom. This is a feather-legged orb weaver. Um, this, is, uh, this is a group of spiders that you can find in Ontario. Um, and as you can see in this photo, the spider has wrapped up a fly extremely tightly. And so instead of biting prey, these spiders um, just, they use silk to, to wrap up the prey extremely tightly and sort of squeeze it to death rather than uh, envenomating it. Uh, more, more typically, the black widow, like you see here with its little red tip fangs, has caught a spider, or sorry, a, a fly in its web. Um, so the venom is primarily for capturing insects um, and it allows spiders to capture prey that's much larger than them. Here's another black widow with a big beetle that it has, um, had is immobilized with a combination of its silk and venom. And then black widows are unusual among spiders in that they can also prey on vertebrates. So things like snakes, lizards, small rodents. Um, so here's a picture of a spider with a coral snake, I believe, um, a black widow from, from the Southwestern United States. So they have evolved to capture vertebrate prey we are vertebrates, of course, and so this is the reason why black widows can be dangerous to humans um, is because they have venom components that uh, are toxic to vertebrates. So some arthropods do feed on human blood, like flies, um, bed bugs, fleas, mites, and ticks. Some of these um, can even transmit diseases like ticks and mosquitoes and things like that. Uh, spiders do not do this. They don't feed on our blood. Um, they, they don't feed on the blood of the vertebrate prey that they take if they're black widows and so on. Um, so spiders are really not interested in biting us um, and very rarely do so. Uh, medically significant spiders in Canada. So some spiders can harm humans. In Canada, the only ones that are um, sort of considered dangerous or medically important are the black widows in genus Latrodectus. We have two species, the Western black widow on the West Coast and the Northern black widow um, in Southern Ontario and Quebec. And I'm getting ahead of myself because I've got a map here. So this is North America. There are several species of black widows on this continent. So we've got the Southern black widow in the Southern United States, we have the red widow, um, which is endemic to Florida. This is a beautiful one. There is the northern black widow, which uh, reaches southern Ontario and southern Quebec. The brown widow is introduced to North America um, quite recently and is mainly found um, across the southern states and into California. And then the western black widow, uh, which is the one that I've studied for the last 10 years, um, which ranges from Mexico and Texas in the south all the way up uh, into southern British Columbia, uh, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So the only spiders capable of harming humans in Canada are the widows. And then in North America, um, there's another group, the recluse spiders in genus Luxosceles. We don't have these in Canada. Um, despite what some um, pest control companies, for instance, would have you uh, think, this is, this is a screen grab from a pest control company advertising services in Toronto, um, claiming to provide 
brown recluse control, um, which drives me uh, up the wall because these spiders don't, don't occur in Canada. Um, this is another story um, that you might remember from a couple of years ago when uh, some offices uh, in Ottawa were evacuated because of uh, a so-called brown recluse infestation, which turned out to be um, just yellow sack spiders. And if the, um, yeah, if, if the government people responsible for that building had just uh, called some of their own entomologists, they might have uh, avoided a costly uh, fumigation. So the, um, the recluse spiders occur in mostly in the southern and central United States. This map is slightly out of date. The, the reclusa zone um, might go a little bit further to the east um, and kind of creep into some, some states that in this image it doesn't cover. But this is basically um, the extent of, of where these spiders live, with a few exceptions. The recluse spiders live um, in homes and they like to hide out in crevices and boxes and things like this. So you do sometimes get um, hitchhikers that end up um, in places outside of this range, um, but it's quite rare and they're not established anywhere outside of this range. Um, and I think I'm aware of four or five individual recluse spiders that have ended up in Canada over the last 50 years or so. Um, but again, they, they certainly aren't established here and, and don't occur here commonly. People do get, unfortunately, diagnosed with recluse bites in Canada. Um, and I would argue that these are um, likely misdiagnoses because the spiders don't occur here. And these are just a few of the things um, that can be or have been misdiagnosed as spider bites, um, rec recluse bites in particular, bacterial infections, fungal infections, parasitic infections, viruses, um, and then on and on it goes. So I don't expect you to read all these. The point is that there are a lot of things that can easily be mistaken for spider bites that are a better bet um, for a country where the spider doesn't actually live. And I would argue that misdiagnoses might be more dangerous than spider bites because something like Lyme disease, misdiagnosed as a spider bite, uh, wouldn't be treated correctly. Um, most spider bites, the treatment is rest, ice, compression, elevation. It goes away on its own. Um, if it's a misdiagnosis of something like Lyme disease or a bacterial infection, um, then you're not getting the proper treatment. Um, and that's that would be worse than anything that a spider could actually do to you. So spiders don't eat humans. They don't feed on our blood. They do eat insects and other arthropods. And let's talk a little bit about how they do that. So most spiders um, have very poor vision. And so their senses are concentrated on their feet. Um, this is a diagram of sensory hairs on a spider, on the tip of a spider's leg. So it uses hairs on its legs for taste, for touch, um, for hearing, and also for smell. And um, most spiders do have eyes, but they tend to have very poor vision. And so rely on these other senses um, for hunting and, uh, and communication. So spiders have a number of um, different modes of hunting. You're probably pretty familiar with web building spiders like the orb weavers, um, but spiders that do build webs have a variety of designs. There's the, the typical orb webs, there are sheet webs with funnel-like retreats, um, there are messy tangle webs or cobwebs, some people call them, uh, dome webs. You'll see if you go in a, for a forest walk, um, early in the morning when the dew is still out, you'll, you'll often see these either dome-shaped or bowl-shaped webs in the trees. Those are made by, um, by linophiids. Um, and so there's, there's a whole, whole variety of different web types, and it depends on the family that the spider's in and even the species it is, um, what that web design looks like and how it operates. So this is a, a European garden spider. You'll probably have just started to see these um, all over the place because this is their time of year. So they build these aerial orb webs that intersect um, flying insects. Uh, yellow garden spiders, also common in Southern Ontario. Um, they have these beautiful zigzag decorations on their webs, which are thought to um, potentially attract insects or, um, or cause, prevent birds from running into the web or possibly both. Um, 
bridge orb weavers, also common in Southern Ontario, and uh, long-jawed orb weavers. These spiders build their web at an angle or sometimes even horizontally over bodies of water to intercept um, emerging aquatic insects as they fly up, as they um, come out of the water. Um, and this is a really cool one, the triangle weaver. This is in the same family as the spider I showed you earlier that has no venom. Um, and you might not be able to see the spider in the left hand of this image. You see the triangle shaped web on the right and then the spider is there on the left, this tiny little thing holding this um, snare. And um, you can see there's actually a, a midge, I think caught in the web on the right hand side. But if a larger insect um, runs into this triangle shaped web, the, the spider will actually let go of the silk um, and it will collapse onto the prey. And then it'll rush over and um, wrap it up really tightly with its silk. Uh, lace mesh weavers build these teeny tiny dense webs um, on the tips of grasses and other vegetation. These are only a couple millimeters long. This is a male and female here together. Uh, this is the dome spider that I was talking about earlier that builds that um, kind of bowl shaped, uh, upside down bowl shaped web. Um, these have silk, um, sort of a messy tangle of silk above that spider, that uh, flying insects will run into and then they'll uh, drop down onto the, uh, onto the web and the spider will bite them from below. Black widows build a, a messy tangle web under a driftwood log like here or in a rodent burrow. Um, and then American house spiders. These are relatives of black widows, same family. Um, they're very common in homes in Ontario. Um, they'll eat anything like this wood louse, they'll eat flies, they'll eat whatever um, insects are in your house. So I mentioned most spiders have poor vision. These are the exceptions and you can tell because they have really large eyes. So jumping spiders and wolf spiders tend to be the ones who, um, who are wandering hunters who use vision. Uh, this is a trichosa wolf spider, thin-legged wolf spiders. These are really common um, on beaches and, and down by the lake shore. Uh, this is a beautiful one, the beach wolf spider, Arctosa littoralis, also present in, in Ontario. Um, that's this beautiful sand color. This is another wolf spider that lives um, near the water and hunts on the water. And then fishing spiders or dock spiders, um, you're probably familiar with if you have a cottage on a lake, um, they like to hang out on docks and they do um, hunt on the water. They rest their legs on the surface of the water and they can detect vibrations from fish or tadpoles or aquatic insects underneath the water or landing on the water. Um, and uh, this is another relative, Dolomedes triton, another fishing spider, and they do in fact eat fish and they can dive under the water after fish um, or they'll also sometimes see them dive under the dock if you scare them um, and they can stay underwater for about 30 minutes without coming up for air. Nursery web spiders are other visual hunters. Um, these are close relatives of the dock spiders. And then jumping spiders. This is a beautiful one, Habernatus decorus that you can find in Ontario. Uh, this is an ant mimicking jump sp jumping spider. So it's, you can see that it's uh, cephalothorax is kind of modified to make it look like it has two segments instead of only one. Um, and the bold, bold jumper, uh, Phidippus audax, is probably um, the biggest jumping spider in Ontario. Super cute with this um, greenish blue chelicerae. Um, and the jumping spiders are, are cat-like predators, so they'll stalk and pounce on their prey. And actually a fun thing to do if you ever see one of these in your house um, or on a wall outside your house is um, if you have a laser pointer, um, they will play with a laser pointer the same way that a cat will. If you shine a laser pointer in front of a jumping spider, it'll pounce on the, uh, on the little dot. The Eastern person spider um, is another one from Southern Ontario, and then ambush predators. So a lot of spiders will just sit there and wait, um, not on a web, but just on vegetation. So um, one of those is the flower crab spider, Messini navatia. Um, they will just sit on a flower and wait for um, insects that are coming to get nectar and, um, and grab them. You can see the spider kind of in this pose, like it's waiting to give you a hug. Um, and then this is the same species, 
um, which has this cool ability to change color. So that's one of many superpowers of spiders. This, um, this species can switch colors from yellow or orange to white over a number of days. And so it can match the background that it sits on um, and blend in. Uh, here's another species of, um, of cryptic uh, yellow flower crab spider. And then they're not all um, flower dwelling. This is Zysticus. Um, here's a, a sort of drab brown crab spider on a grass that has captured a flying ant. And this is a running crab spider, different family, but similar lifestyle. Again, um, sitting sort of camouflaged on, um, on a stem of grass waiting for, uh, for prey. Uh, and lynx spiders are also ambush predators. They are, um, again, sort of cat-like, thus the name, um, with these really spiky uh, legs. Sack spiders, also super common ambush predators often on leaves and things. And then another really important ha habitat for spiders is human homes. So this um, study came out quite a while ago now, but it was basically sampling um, all of the arthropods in homes. And if you watch the nature of things, actually um, my, my former supervisor, Madian Andrade was on an episode of the nature of things where they went around houses in Toronto sampling um, to find out what insects and spiders were there. And so this pie chart shows that sort of flies are very common in houses, 23% um, of, of the, the sort of diversity of homes, but spiders were a close second at 19%. So these are really common um, and they eat all the other stuff, all the other insects that are in houses. And um, that study found that 100% of the houses that the researchers went, went into had spiders in them and almost 80% of the rooms in each house had spiders in them. So spiders are everywhere. You might've heard that you're never more than two meters from a spider. That's probably not exactly true, but there's probably a spider in whatever room you're in right now um, because there's prey for them. There's insects in your house. And so the spiders are there eating them. Um, some of the common house spiders that you might encounter are the broad-faced sack spider, the yellow sack spider, which has a bad reputation, but um, which is undeserved. These are not harmful to humans. They're just really common. And, and so people encounter them a lot. The spitting spider that I mentioned before really likes to live in, in houses. Um, zebra jumpers are very common on the outside of houses. On a sunny day, you'll see them um, on, on rock walls or on, on a white siding. Um, here's one that's captured a, uh, a midge, I think, of some kind. And cellar spiders, uh, as the name suggests, are common in homes. And uh, these spiders are great predators. They'll eat all kinds of things, flies that are much bigger than them, um, and they'll also eat other spiders. So spiders are, are also um, useful in agricultural ecosystems and gardens. Um, research has shown that insect numbers increase when spiders are removed from fields and gardens, um, which means that the presence of the spiders is controlling those insect numbers and keeping them down. So having gar spiders in your garden is a good thing to, um, to, to control insects that, um, that are herbivorous. Spiders kill more prey than they can eat, which is a useful feature. So they will just kill and kill and kill if there's prey to be had, even if they're not hungry. So that makes them useful as, um, as a control agent for insects. And um, research shows that the more different kinds of spiders, um, spider assemblages will decrease prey biomass. So the more different kinds of spiders you have with those different modes of hunting, web building, ambush predators, wandering hunters, um, the better the insects in an agricultural field or in a garden will be controlled. And this is really important because uh, a recent estimate shows that spiders eat somewhere between 400 and 880 million tons of insects a year. So they're super important um, as predators of insects. Um, and just imagine a world where those hundreds of millions of tons of insects were not being eaten by spiders and were um, flying and crawling around, eating our crops, um, biting us and our pets and things like that. Um, spider silk on its own is really useful. Um, 
experiments show that just the presence of silk on plants can decrease her herbivore damage because um, like the little caterpillar or beetle, when it detects the silk, that is a cue that there's a predator nearby. So it will stay away um, in order to avoid being, being eaten. And um, spiders in, in gardens, for instance, um, eat some of the insects that we might not want around. So this is a Zysticus crab spider eating a yellow jacket, which can be a bit of a pain um, in the summer. This is a wolf spider eating a mosquito. Um, so mosquitoes, midges, biting flies, these things are, are some prey for, for spiders. Um, and this is just a cool example, not from North America, but there's an African spider that is a specialist predator on mosquitoes. And it prefers um, blood fed mosquitoes to, to um, ones that haven't fed. So this is actually an exception to what I said about spiders not feeding on human blood. This spider does eat human blood indirectly because it really likes to eat um, mosquitoes that have, have already fed. So um, the first reason that I would suggest that you might want to love spiders is that they eat insects. They're super important um, for controlling insects and eating the insects that bother humans, and they eat a lot of them. Okay, the second, uh, second section is prey. So spiders are themselves prey for many other animals. Um, birds love to eat spiders. This is a great tit. Um, and uh, a study showed that over 75% of their, their diet um, feeding the nestlings was spiders. So these are important prey for birds. Um, hummingbirds use spider silk for their nests, and they also feed spiders to their chicks. Uh, deer mice are important predators of spiders. Um, spiders themselves are important predators of other spiders. So this is a pirate spider. It is um, an invader of other spider webs. So this is a male pirate spider that has entered an orb web. They don't build webs themselves, but they go into the webs of other spiders and they pluck the um, silk and vibrate it in a way that mimics a prey animal caught in the web. And so by doing that, they lure out the resident spider and then attack it. So here the male has, um, the male pirate spider has eaten the resident of this web. And then sometimes they'll actually take over the web and use it themselves to capture prey. Uh, lizards eat spiders. Um, alligator lizards are, are important predators of black widows, for instance, on the West Coast. And cellar spiders, as I mentioned before, they love to eat other spiders, including spiders that are much bigger than them, like black widows, um, like house spiders. Wasps are probably the most important enemies of spiders because a lot of uh, wasps specialize on feeding spiders um, to, their, to their offspring. So spider wasps, they, um, they find a spider, they sting it, they paralyze it, they keep it alive, and then they take the spider back to their burrow, then they lay an egg on the spider, then they close up the burrow, and then the egg hatches, and then the developing wasp um, eats the spider alive. Toads also eat spiders, and then finally humans eat spiders. Um, not common in North America, but in other parts of the world, uh, tarantulas are, are a source of food for humans. So um, spiders have a number of enemies. Uh, a lot of animals like birds, lizards, and so on um, like to eat them, but spiders would prefer not to be eaten. And so they have a lot of um, cool ways of avoiding becoming prey. Um, and this is sort of the main superpower section, um, spider defenses. So one of them is crypsis. So being difficult to see. This is a photo um, that my partner took in French Guiana of a tree trunk. And um, if you look really closely at the tree trunk, you might be able to spot the spider. I'll give you a hint, it's right there. And then I'll zoom it in for you. So this is a tree trunk spider. Um, it's beautiful. It is extremely cryptic. I was staring at this tree for several minutes before I saw the spider. Um, and so it's sitting there sort of uh, hugging its egg sac with its front legs. So um, the pale sort of circular area at the bottom of this image, which is covered with lichen, is the spider's egg sac. And it has it has decorated the, um, the silk egg sac with bits of lichen and so on to camouflage it so that it's almost impossible for predators to detect. Um, so that's one way that spiders avoid being, being eaten is if predators can't see them, they can't eat them. Um, the beach wolf spiders are also very cryptic on the sand. Um, 
even members of the same species on different beaches, there'll be different colors to blend in with, um, with the color of the sand. Uh, I already mentioned the flower crab spiders um, that camouflage themselves against the, uh, the backdrop of the flower they're sitting on. Um, this grass spider um, looks just like the blade of grass that it's sitting on. And then spiders can pretend to be things that they are not. The most common one is ants because ants tend to sting. They're kind of nasty. They don't taste good. Most, most things like birds don't like to eat ants. Um, so for spiders, um, cosplaying as ants is a, is a good tactic for avoiding being eaten. Um, here's an incredible ant mimic. This is, this is a spider, not an ant, despite how it looks. Um, and it has this incredibly modified um, cephalothorax area um, that has been elongated to make it look just like an ant. And um, these ant mimics take their first pair of legs um, and wave them like antennae. So they actually um, walk like an ant as well to, uh, to complete the, uh, the costume. This is the one that we have in, in Ontario, an ant mimic, not quite as um, spectacularly ant-like as the previous one, but you can see its first pair of legs are actually um, colored in such a way to um, give the illusion of antennae. And it also waves them around in front of its head as it walks. Um, this is another cool one. This photo was taken at Tommy Thompson Park, um, and I'll give you a moment to look closely to see if you can spot the spider among these ants. It's, uh, it's right in the center of this image. And then here's another image with two spiders um, that are ant mimics that actually live among the ants. And um, they uh, obviously get protection in this way um, by, by living with the ants. Uh, spiders can also pretend to be bird poop. This is a, a bird dropping mimic in, um, in the orb weaver family. Um, and uh, these are actually really cool spiders that are, are predators of, of moths. And they, they make um, a, a blend of uh, compounds that mimics the pheromone of the moths that they prey on. So um, unsuspecting male mosques will moths will fly towards the spider thinking that there's a female moth to mate with. Um, and the, um, the bolus spider um, has a uh, really awesome way of hunting. It has this um, drop of sticky glue on a silk thread and it waves it around and sort of um, catches the, uh, the moth in midair. Um, spiders arguably have warning coloration. So the classic one is the red hourglass on the Black Widow. I'm not super convinced that this is actually an effective um, anti-predator tactic, um, but it is thought that the red hourglass kind of um, signals danger. This is, this is related to um, wasps and bees, for instance, that have black and yellow stripes. Um, black and yellow, black and red tend to be warning coloration. Um, some spiders can spray venom. This is a super cool one as well, the lynx spider. Um, this is a female, and you can see in the bottom of the photo these little orange uh, rumps of her, her babies. Spiders are very defensive of their offspring, and so this green lynx spider, um, when it's guarding uh, a nest of, of its offspring, if you go up and bother them, this is an image of a person with a glass slide, putting it up to the green link spider sitting there on those pink flowers, the, the spider will spray venom. So that's what it looks like on the slide after the venom has shot out of its fangs. Um, and uh, this behavior was actually um, discovered by um, a person who, who was sprayed in the eye by a lynx spider initially um, because these spiders are, are they seem to be able to aim kind of at a predator's eyes. Um, I just saw a really cool talk recently from someone who tested this um, with a clever experiment using a photograph of an owl's face with big eyes. And if they put the, the photo of the, of the owl's face up to the um, lake spider, it would shoot venom at its eyes. Um, very effective. Uh, spiders can throw sticky silk. So this is the, the sort of go-to defense of black widows. Um, I don't recommend this trying at home. Don't touch black widows with your bare hands. Um, but as someone who has worked with them extensively, I can say that if I poke and prod a black widow, she's not going to bite me. The first thing that she's going to do is run away. And then if I keep on bothering her, she will do this. She will make these big globs of sticky silk and fling them at my finger. 
this is very effective um, for if, if a predator is coming at her, a wasp or something, um, this sticky silk can sort of stop them in, in their tracks. Um, for me, when I've got this sticky silk on my finger, if I go like this, it'll glue my fingers right together. It's very, very strong. Um, and they can also play dead. So again, don't try this at home, but this spider is playing dead. It's having, it's, it's not defensive. It's not trying to bite. It will just sort of curl up into a little ball, hoping to be left alone. So second reason to love spiders is that they are important food sources for other animals, um, including birds and other spiders, which is why they have developed all these interesting uh, defensive tactics. Okay, finally, I'm gonna end with a bit about love. So spiders, as I've mentioned earlier, are, um, are excellent mothers. They uh, build these silk egg sacs that they will often guard, like this um, Zolotes. Uh, here's another running grab spider sitting on its egg sac, um, guarding it against predators. The cellar spiders in your house, they actually carry their eggs around in their mouth, um, which means that they can't eat while they're waiting for their, uh, their babies to uh, hatch. Uh, dock spiders also carry their egg sacs around in their mouth. Um, wolf spiders carry their egg sacs around um, connected to their spinnerets. And then when the spiderlings emerge, they uh, all climb onto the mother of wolf spiders back and she carries them around like that until they're ready to go off on their own. Um, black widows, they, um, they protect their egg sacs. Um, they're quite defensive. So if you were trying to get bitten by a black widow, sort of poking them or grabbing their egg sac would be a good way to get a defensive bite because that's one situation in which they are quite uh, fierce. Um, but they do this cool thing where on a sunny day, they'll bring the egg sac out into the sun to warm it up to help the developing spiderlings. Um, and then they'll bring it back um, and hide it at night or in the rain when, uh, when the weather isn't good. And then um, when the baby black widows emerge from the egg sac, they'll all go out onto the mother's web and they'll live there for a while um, and uh, even sometimes share food with the mother. So this is an example of the um, mother black widow has captured a beetle and this little uh, spiderling is, um, is sharing in the meal. And then some spiders take this sort of um, maternal care to the next level. This is Stegodiphus. Um, this species, um, the female, after she um, has her egg sac and the spiderlings emerge, uh, she starts to digest her own body um, in preparation for the spiderlings to start feeding on her. So she sacrifices herself uh, to feed her, her offspring to set them up for success in life. Um, romance. So the most spectacular sort of courtship in the spider world is the peacock spiders from uh, Australia. If you have never seen a YouTube video of a peacock spider dancing, I encourage you after this to just go to uh, YouTube and type in peacock spider dance. Jurgen Otto has some amazing videos. Um, these spiders are just spectacular. These are all males, of course, and they have this peacock-like tail that they wave um, for the female during courtship. Um, just spectacular animals. They're super, super tiny, um, only a couple millimeters long, and just have these gorgeous courtship displays. Uh, Murmurachne formicaria, these are ant mimics. These are two males fighting over a female. This is an introduced species that you can find in Toronto. Um, Western black widows, these males also fight over females, sometimes um, to the death or to um, to with some extreme outcomes. So these males are grappling on a female's web, fighting over who gets to be the one to mate with her. And um, it gets quite, uh, quite heated. And this is an example of a male after a fight where he now only has four legs left because the other male has bitten his legs um, and uh, spiders actually drop legs defensively. That's one thing that I didn't mention. So if a, if a predator or another spider um, bites the leg, of, of this spider, they can just drop it um, and, and go on without it. Um, mating can be quite dangerous. You're probably familiar with the idea of black widows eating their mates, although the real risk is uh, when a male first enters a female's web or if he enters the web of a female who's not ready to mate, um, then he's much more likely to become dinner than, um, than to, to become a, um, a mate. 
And then although sexual cannibalism in North American black widows is actually fairly rare in terms of the male being eaten after copulation, they can, males actually are capable of mating with multiple females because they do tend to survive. Um, but redback spiders, these are relatives of black widows that live in Australia, these males actually sacrifice themselves to the female. So this is a male who is transferring sperm to the female. He has done a little somersault, put his abdomen right in front of the female's fangs, and she is starting to snack on him while he's transferring sperm. And the reason that he does this is if he lets her eat him, she will use more of his sperm um, to father offspring. So it's better for his, um, him to, to pass on his genes and, um, and be the father of more, more spiderlings. This is another cool one, dock spiders. Um, the male during copulation will spontaneously die. And then the female just has to sort of carry him around hanging from her, her abdomen um, and his whole body acts as a mating plug that prevents other males from mating with her. Spiders also give one another gifts um, in the context of mating. So this is a gift giving spider, um, Pisora mirabilis. The male will capture a fly, um, wrap it in silk and then offer it to the female. And then while she's busy eating that gift, he'll mate with her. Um, this is another example of that, a, um, a long-jawed orb weaver where the male presents a gift to the female um, sort of to distract her <laughs> while, while they are mating. And if she's busy eating the prey, she's less likely to eat him. Uh, and then silk is also used for so-called bridal veils. So this tiny male here is depositing silk all over the top of this giant female. Um, this doesn't physically bind the female. You can see that the silk is mostly kind of on her cephalothorax and abdomen. And so experimental work has shown that the function of this silk is sort of the, the feeling of the silk and the, the chemicals associated with the silk cause the female to become more receptive to the male. Um, crab spiders also do this. The male ties the female down to the substrate. Um, and this male has actually got sort of double, um, Two things going on here, the female is busy eating prey and the male has covered her with silk and attached silk um, to, to the substrate while he's mating with her. And I'll just show you another view of that so you can see how the male is underneath transferring sperm while the female is busy eating and uh, also has that silk all over her body. And then black widows as well um, do this silk wrapping thing. Although in this species, um, you see the male here has, has wrapped silk all around the female's first pair of legs. Um, and I think um, that this is likely to, to put pheromones, um, chemicals in, that are in the male silk into contact with those hairs, the sensory hairs on the female's legs that are used to taste and smell. Um, and this is providing information to the female um, about the male. So finally, um, I hope that I've convinced you that um, black widows have, or sorry, spiders in general and black widows have some fascinating behavior um, and some beautiful um, morphology. And I will stop there and take questions. Thank you so much. Catherine, that was fantastic. Uh, just quite, quite overwhelming, I have to say. Um, and and it, it just, it, it's just such a torrent of amazing, amazing, amazing uh, stories. And, and I'm sure that, you know, we've, we forced you to compress them all so that, um, you know, yeah, you sort of a with... whirlwind tour. Yeah, absolutely. Of spiders. I could talk about any one of those things for, for, um, for probably 20 minutes, but yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. No hats you off. Wet your appetite to learn a bit more. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And, and so I know that our chat already has, um, a number of questions and, um, and, and I, I, I'm definitely going to run through those. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to put an idea in your head, though, Catherine, for, for starters, which is, of course, that we, we um, at the Toronto Field Naturalists, we give guided walks and we reach out to the public, often people who, um, you know, it's an entry into nature generally. And, um, and, and spiders uh, in the Toronto area, you know, you have to wonder, well, how would we, what would be the... Um, you know, the most charismatic 
um, a microfauna <laughs> spider that you might recommend to us to, to, to tell the story again and again, you know, and, and you may not want to answer that right away, but just to think about it. Um, because, you, you know, just like the monarch, the Mexico uh, migration, you could tell that story a thousand times and people are always fascinated. And, and I think we need a spider story like that. That's a, that's a great question. And I'll think about that and get back to you. I have to like, um, I would want to choose something that's pretty reliable for people to see, like whether it's in their backyards or down by the lake shore or something like that. Um, so I'll have to think about what the best sort of spider ambassador might be. Um, I think there are a few candidates. Absolutely. So, so uh, among other things, there's been uh, great admiration for your earrings, and and uh, and you know maybe someone will be making pottery with spiders, um, and uh, and uh, she asks, uh, what was Charlotte in Charlotte's Web? Uh, yes, um, Charlotte was a barn orb weaver. I think it's Arrhenius cavaticus. Let me double check that. Um, Barn orb weaver. I remember she sacrificed herself, didn't she? She did. Um, yes. yes, Arrhenius Cavaticus. And let me check and see if that's one that is present in Ontario. I suspect that it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Charlotte was a, a barn orb weaver. Excellent. And I have a, you, you brought, you had that photo of the uh, coral snake being eaten. How does a black widow eat a coral snake? Yes, so that's that's a great question. Um, and I think it is sort of very slowly. So the, I mean, capturing it is the first step. And so the Black Widow silk um, is extremely strong and sticky. So, and I mean, that was probably a baby set snake. It wasn't a huge snake, but a small snake or small lizard can sort of get stuck um, in the web and then the spider will rush down and then will wrap it with that incredibly sticky silk. And it will, it will take, um, it'll wrap it and, and they're actually, they're very careful, um, black widows about, they don't want to put themselves in harm's way. So they'll kind of stand off, they'll fling sticky silk. They'll wait until they sort of feel like it's safe that the, that the thing is captured. Then they'll go and give it a bite, inject some venom, and then they'll kind of stand off and wait for it to slow down, or they'll add some more silk if it's still thrashing around and sort of alternate between wrapping, biting, the venom will eventually paralyze the the snake, and then um, yes, the the spider would feed on it probably for for several days. Probably wouldn't be able to finish the whole thing because that would be a huge meal. And and that's sort of um, I think of it's a it would be a rare event for a spider to to eat a snake or a mouse or or any kind of small vertebrate, but sort of like a a once in a lifetime like bonanza where they never have to eat anything ever again. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, yeah, fascinating. So so they are just experts. They they are not dilettantes at what they do. Yeah, um, I I have a question here from Jennifer Smith. There there are tiny silky spheres of, uh, in her basement. Are those balls of baby spiders? I would need to see a photograph, but if you ever see a, a sphere of silk, my guess would be spider egg sac. Um, yeah. And they come in kind of all shapes and sizes, sometimes very, very tiny. Um, but yeah, I'd need to, I need to see an image to, to, uh, to be confident. Sure. Sure. Yeah. There, there's also a, a, a question and I'm sure that this would, you know, could be like a, a great story over drinks, but, but how you became interested in, in studying spiders. Um, yeah. So, so that was an accident. Uh, I was terrified of spiders as a child. I, I would freak out if I, if I saw a spider, I would, I would run and hide. I would call for my mother and my mother would very calmly pick up the spider and take it outside. She wasn't afraid. So I certainly didn't learn it from her. Um, but I was afraid of spiders, um, had no interest in them, um, never looked closely at one until I was in my 20s. And uh, I was an undergraduate student at Simon Fraser University, um, taking an invertebrate zoology class. My professor um, skipped spiders because he was an arachnophobe. So we didn't even discuss spiders in the uh, in the class. But my TA, uh, Samantha Viber, was um, studying the um, vibratory communication of black widows and hobo spiders at the time. And at the end of the, so she brought in a spider to the laboratory 
um, and sort of forced us to look at them. So that was like my first up close and personal with them. And I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. And then she advertised at the end of the uh, class uh, that year that she was hiring a laboratory assistant to help her with her PhD research over the summer. And I was interested in biology. I wanted to, to, to do biology. Um, I was interested in graduate school, but I had no research experience. So I applied for the job, even though I was afraid of spiders. And I figured, well, if I get the job, I'll just have to get over that because it's such a good opportunity. Um, so I got the job started working with black widows and hobo spiders. And as soon as I started learning more about their behavior and observing them closely, um, I fell in love with them and I have been studying them ever since. So I did my, my master's degree in that same laboratory and then went on to do my PhD uh, at, at the University of Toronto. And um, yeah, I, I particularly love black widows. I didn't even get into my research um, where I study how black widows communicate with each other using uh, pheromones and vibrations. Um, but yeah, they have these fascinating um, lives and it was really, really learning that spiders talk to one another using um, vibrations and chemicals that kind of got me hooked, um, that they have these um, really sophisticated communication systems and, um, and relationships going on under our noses, you know, in the corner of your house that you don't think about. Yes, yes. And, and endless, endless fascination. Absolutely. Um, if I'm uh, John Foster asks about a, a good field guide to use for Ontario spiders. Unfortunately, there isn't a um, there isn't a great one there. So there is a nice um, guide to the spiders of Toronto that you used to be able to get for free from the library. Um, I don't know if it's in print anymore, but if you if you go to your local library and ask if they still have the spiders of Toronto, um, it's part of a series. There's a bees of Toronto and you probably have seen these. Um, so that's kind of a nice like general introduction to spiders that has um, has a guide to some of the most most common species in the Toronto area. I'm just going to run over to my bookshelf one second. Sure. And and the 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 spiders of Toronto, you can find that online as part of the city of Toronto's biodiversity series. And um, the Toronto Field Naturalists actually um, helped to fund um, those those biodiversity booklets when they first came out. Uh, unfortunately, the the hard print versions of them are impossible to get. But on, yes, there you go. Um, uh, Annette is showing that. Yeah, one. and it is I, online now. So yes, it's online, so it's just Toronto. terrific. Yes. Um, so there isn't a field guide specific to Ontario, but this is quite good. Spiders of the North Woods. Okay. Um, so it's part of the North Woods uh, series. So it's um, like, oh, so this is the... Um, yeah, I guess so. This is the the area that it covers includes part part of Ontario, um, so that's quite good. And it's not a, it's a quite a small book, so it, of course it doesn't have everything, but it's a great place to start in terms of getting familiar with some of the uh, spider fauna that you can find in Ontario. So I would recommend that one. Spiders of the Carolinas is similar um, and is obviously a, a slightly different region, but. Um, also has some overlap with, with Ontario. But if you were gonna choose one, um, Spiders of the North Woods would probably be, be the place to start. Um, yes. And also there's great, um, Bug Guide is a great online community um, that has a really good um, spider section and you can kind of go on Bug Guide and, um, and browse spiders and use the, the function to look at the range of different spiders and see what's present in in Ontario as well. Um, and if you use iNaturalist, of course, you can you can also browse there um, to look at um, at some of the uh, the spiders that are that are around. Yes, excellent. So so uh, uh, Catherine, there are many, many, you know, thank yous and, and great presentations and, and, and so on. Uh, people are very effusive. Um, uh, someone asked, Donata asked about any migration that are migrations are being observed uh, due to, to changing climate. I mean, you mentioned the brown recluses, um, 
uh, range is expanding. Range is expanding. And I'm, I'll yeah. bet you that for the other zillion spider species, there are similar changes, except nobody's really paying attention. Yeah, yeah. So I think the the only one that I'm I'm really familiar with um, that's relevant is the is the northern black widow. Um, it is it has always been in southern Ontario, but it is being seen farther and farther north. Um, and so a study came out about that. Um, a few years ago that was actually using um, iNaturalist and, and sort of citizen science observations to show that uh, northern black widows are expanding their range farther northwards into uh, Ontario and Quebec. Um, and I've, I've seen sort of anecdotally the, the reports of northern black widows in, in Ontario seem to have been increasing um, over the last few years. They're still quite rare and they're, they're very secretive. The whole time I lived in Ontario, I never found one, which is very upsetting. I really want to, <laughs> to see them. I've gone out looking for them and I haven't been able to find them. So they're not common, um, but they are around. And um, and certainly I think their range is expanding um, and climate change is, is gonna have that effect. Um, but in terms of seasonal variation, I will say like fall is, is the best time to see spiders. They are very seasonal. They tend to kind of hide out in the winter or die off and then, um, there the, the sort of big boom for spiders is is late summer early fall um when uh, males are out looking for females and females are are getting ready to build their egg sacs and so on a lot of spiders um in canada will the female will build an egg sac um at the end of the fall and then the egg sac will actually overwinter um or the female will overwinter as a mature adult and then at the beginning of the spring, then she'll she'll reproduce, and then the spiderlings will emerge in the spring, and so on. Um, so so it depends on the species, but there are certainly um, sort of different times of year when it's particularly good to see certain uh, certain kinds of spiders. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, there's been there's been uh, you know a suggestion that we really need a follow up series at some point. So I, I think it, it gives you a sense of of you know how how keen people are and 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 also thank you very much to Sean for his terrific photos which without which you know we would we would only have the vaguest idea of what these what these uh uh arachnids look like and um yes so it, it's just it's just um yeah it's it's delightful um I, I think that maybe in the interest of time, and, and it's it's a quarter to four, and, and I know people want to get out, that I, I am going to uh, suggest that we uh, we draw this to a, a close today. And, and, and um, I, I should say that your presentation, we're going to end the, the, the recording shortly, but the, re the recording will be available on TFN's website. So thank you very much, Catherine, for, for allowing us to do that and, um, and just for, for spending your, your time with us. I know you're in transition and, and it's a sort of a, a tumultuous time <laughs> for, for you in, in a new postdoctoral position. So we really, really appreciate that. That. And, and for everybody here, I'm hoping you can stick around for just a few minutes because I have some important announcements for, for uh, people about upcoming events. So, so I'm going to end the recording now. Um, uh, this should do it. Um, yes.